I'm Suzy Leblanc, I'm the Artistic and Executive Director of Early Music Vancouver, and I'm really honoured to be here today with three very distinguished guests to speak about a recent film called Black Fiddlers. I just want to say that uh, the film was written, edited, narrated and directed by Eduardo Montes Bradley, who is one of my guests today. Hello, Eduardo. Hello, how are you, Suzy? Very well, thank you so much. Um, my second guest is Earl White, a wonderful black fiddler featured in Eduardo's film, who plays, I think, in the old time style. I don't know. You'll correct me about that. We'll talk about that in a moment. But hi, Earl. Very nice to have you here. Hi. Nice to meet you as well. And my third guest is Cape Breton, Cape Breton style fiddler and Baroque violinist David Greenberg, who spent a major part of his life in Canada, though he is originally from the U.S., and David is here, uh, is also an artist in residence at Early Music Vancouver for the Bach Festival this summer. And uh, being a fiddler, I didn't want to be the only one to ask questions because I don't know anything about fiddling. So I'm uh -huh. very happy to have David here with me. So welcome, all of you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's really a fantastic project. Um, before we start into it, can I just give a little more introduction about Eduardo Montes Bradley? Just to say to people who might not know him or his work that he's directed and produced over 50 biographical portrayals of distinguished artists and scientists and intellectuals. Uh, just to name a few, there's Rita Dove, an American poet, a film on Daniel Chester French, uh, Julian Bond, Alice Parker, and other works that I found really rele relevant, relevant to speak about, uh, a film called Unearthed and Understood, a film about slavery at the University of Virginia, and Samba on Your Feet, a unique look into Afro-Brazilian cultural traditions through music and the evolution of carnival. So incredible diversity in your films and all films I'd like to see. And, and if you're interested, everybody, you can find a lot more on Eduardo's website, um, which I think is called The Heritage Project. Is that correct? Heritage Film Project. Heritage Film Project, thank you. And uh, we'll talk more about your upcoming projects as well. But if we go back now to this recent film that interests us because we're showing it at Early Music Vancouver, Black Fiddlers. Um, I, I have just one first question. What inspired you, Eduardo, to make this film? How did you hear about the Black Fiddlers? I was, uh, I was approached by um, uh, scholar in Charlottesville who was interested in the descendants of uh, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, of which two of them, three of them maybe, were fiddlers and were referred to as black fiddlers. And, and that was my first, uh, uh, my first uh, stone on the road because it seems like they were only, it seems like the word black became more important than the fact that they were fiddlers. And, and, and in fact, they ran away from Charlottesville first to Ohio. And then in the case of Easton uh, Hemings, who was going by the name of his mother, Sally Hemings, um, uh, run away from Ohio as well into the wilderness in Wisconsin, in Madison, and adopted the name of his father. In, in, in a sense, it was the reverse operation that Malcolm X, which adopted the X because he didn't know his, the, the, the name of his ancestors and didn't want to have the name of his enslaver. In the case of Thomas Jefferson's son, it was the reverse operation. And he's buried as a Jefferson because he wanted to be a Jefferson. And, and 
and he did not want to be associated with that 16th part of his life that was black because of connotations that that had at the time, you know, um, and also the dangers. Just don't forget that Southerners were going into the North at that time and uh, hunting down anyone that had a drop of uh, black blood, bring them down to the South and enslave them. So it was interesting. I was asked to go and look for black fiddlers and I found, uh, I found no, I found fiddlers that happened to be black <laughs> and, and, and I like to, to, I like to conclude uh, that maybe the premise of the film is that what matters is the music. I, I would agree, and it's, it's. Um, I, if I if I remember correctly from your film, in any case, it the the fiddle music that the black fiddlers were playing is a composite of many different traditions. Anyway, maybe Earl could tell us more about that. Well, when. I think of black fiddlers, I think about, you know, not so much from way or so far back, but basically what was born right here in this country. And, you know, to a certain extent, <clears throat> and I'll make reference to uh, a lot of people refer to black Americans as African Americans. Well, when I hear that, it basically overlooks that aspect of the fact that me as a black person, I was born here. I did uh, an African American to me is someone who immigrated here. So from the immigrant aspect of it and coming over, yes, slaves are brought over and uh, on the plantations, a lot of times they were taught by their masters to play the music because uh, now they became commodities that could be rented out to the next plantation. So again, from my focus on old time music and as a black fiddler is more of what basically had been born out of this country, born out of um, uh, that ancestry of people who were born here in the country and took the music, made very, very large contributions to the music, but no, never, um, but got very little recognition. Until this film was made. Just still, well, uh, until this film was made, as well as um, people like myself being an ambassador and a few other black fiddlers that I know who are ambassadors and being out there playing the music, exposing the music. And part of it, too, is, you know, from my standpoint is, you know, one of the first black people I saw playing um, the violin as a fiddle was uh, Papa John Creech. He was a black uh, violinist, <clears throat> fiddler, who played with um, Little Feet and Jefferson Airplane. Mm -hmm. But on stage, he played it as a violin. Mm -hmm. So uh, as the Greengrass Clogger, we were dancing in Evergreen Valley, Maine, and Papa John Creech was sitting in the green room, just sitting in the corner, playing as a fiddle. Well, you know, I'd seen copious, copious amounts of black violinists but in terms of actually seeing a black fiddler, yeah, this was my first. In addition to that, I had gone as a clogger to many multiple um, fiddlers conventions, uh, mostly rooted around the South, Shenandoah Valley, you know, area. And again, no black fiddlers. <laughs> so. Here there's a, there's a, another one coming up this Thursday, you were just saying, are, are there gonna be black fiddlers there? Last year, we had our one of our first black fiddlers that came here, came all the way down from um, upstate New York. Um, this year, uh, I have a few other people that are basically coming. They're not fiddlers, but they are appreciators of old time music. Um, like, for example, my sister from New Jersey <laughs> is coming. And, you know, and I'm all, all excited about that. But again, part of it too, like when you ask me, are there any black fiddlers coming in the world of old time music, which I frequent, you don't have a lot of black people frequenting that, that environment. And a lot of it is, you know, basically due to uh, years of discrimination and, and segregation. And, you know, so basically they don't go. And yet, I mean, I, I, 
I was riveted watching this documentary. I, the first time through I watched it, um, I had to take, I had to stop every 10 seconds and, and, and go back and listen to it. it's something that I missed. And, okay. and, then, and then, there's just, it's just such a, an incredible, like the history and the celebration of, of these individual black musicians going way back and, and coming right to the, the present day, the younger fiddlers, the younger musicians, and just right. has that that lovely lovely long line through the present, and uh, get, you know with all the the history going on and the and the racism, slavery, oppression, and the cultural context. It's it's just it's it's just riveting, and, and you just have to almost see it like two or three times to to kind of get get the sense of it all. Oh yeah, and again, as you just noted, um, for more people. And in this case, for more black people to be involved, it's important to see themselves represented. Yeah. And yeah. yeah it's again, like I said, I, when I started, I didn't see myself represented. So when I saw Papa John Creech, I was like, whoa, I want to do that. <laughs> oh, how did you so, start, Earl? How did you start? How did I start? Yeah. Uh, I had a, uh, a my best friend who eventually became my wife. Uh, went um, uh, home. We were, I was a student at East Carolina University. She went home for Christmas and she had a uh, brother-in-law who had a fiddle that belonged to his uh, uncle's grandfather. And she, it was just hanging on the wall and she asked uh, if uh, she could take it and let a friend use it. <clears throat> And so she brought it and gave it to me, or at that time lent it to me. And uh, I pretty much already had the aspect or the genre of the music in my head, because prior to that, I had spent X number of years dancing as a green grass clogger. And so when I, yeah, again, happened upon the, pit, the fiddle, I had already been dabbing and playing uh, the guitar. Um, a bunch of the other people on the clogging team also played instruments. So at one point, it, it seemed like uh, the clogging team, we also had our own uh, string band, but we didn't have a fiddle. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, so that's where I came in. I just started it. In fact, it became an appendage. It, I carried it everywhere. I went, even though I yeah, initially I couldn't play it, but any opportunity that I had to take it out, I would do it. Is that the well, violin you play today? No, it's not the one I play today. <laughs> uh, coming at it through the dancing, I mean, it, it reminds me of, uh, of uh, I think it was uh, Justin Robinson in the, in, the, in the documentary talking about learning from Joe Thompson uh -huh. and saying, you know, you, you know you just, you're just there with him and you just use your body. You don't need a brain. You just right. use your body, and and as a dancer, I mean, you you have, but that also reminds me of of something that I I wondered about um, when you talked later on in the, in the documentary about um, what I consider nature versus nurture, you know um, that that you're you're getting the the cultural that you know the, the the dancing and the and the style from mimicking the players around you, probably mostly white. Right. And yet when like you, you talked about it, like if you were going to play I Irish music, you were going to speak the Irish music, but from, you know, you're going to speak it from from what you have inside you uh, right. and which is going to be you know different than 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 what other people have inside them. And, this, and oh, part okay. of that part of that is is being black or white. Absolutely. Right. I, I love that part of the movie as well. When I think it was Rihanna Geddes, who's the banjo player saying something about you know the the melodies were really simple when they were learning from from joe thompson but but the rhythm was the groove was what you you couldn't intellectualize at all and that they figured that out when they were trying to teach it to conservatory students that it was really hard for people to get it because you cannot use your brain it, it's a real embodied thing and that's kind of interesting too in juxtaposition with baroque music and dance because it's the same kind of thing you can't get the feel of the Baroque music if you don't really know how to do it in your body. I, I'm a firm believer of that. So that's a, an interesting uh, mm -hmm. similarity. Yeah. Um, there was a guy in your film near the end, Cedric Watson. 
Oh, that yes. It's in New York. Now, he's... No, 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 no. He's oh. Cedric Watson. Cedric Watson is in Eastern Texas and Louisiana. Yeah, okay, okay. That he makes sense. He sings French. He yeah. sings... Uh, so right. it's Cajun, but, uh, right? Cajun. Kind of like, like Cajun, yeah, yeah. I love, I love that moment. Cajun and Zydeco. Right. Immediately recognized it being Acadian, so yeah. When I when I dis when I found him, uh, that's when I decided that I had to stop the film right there because this was huge. Hmm. Uh, meaning, there were there were expressions of this music and this and this um, and and of black fiddlers throughout the country, and because what is extraordinary here. It's the instrument. The instrument is a passport to freedom. It's a passport to 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 earn a living. Uh, you can take it with you. Uh, from twelve thousand ads run um, in the slavery times, uh, uh, asking for the recapture of runaway slaves. Of the twelve thousand, over one thousand were musicians. And out of those 1,800 were fiddlers. And, and uh, so it's very interesting that they will run away with the fiddle because, you know, it's just, if you, he's, he's either tall or, or short or, or he has a scar on his face, but he plays the fiddle. So yeah. like saying, if you see anybody pulling out the fiddle, let me know because that's probably, you know, it's, it's very interesting, the, the connotations, the, the projection that this simple, Simple, but probably the most successful Baroque invention. <laughs> it's the only one, it's the only Baroque invention that persists, I think. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and by the millions, and by the millions, I mean, six million to seven million violins were imported in the United States only in the 19th century. That is amazing. Very. Yeah. So there's the instrument also and and so just like I didn't find uh, black fiddlers, but I found black people who play the fiddle, I also did not find the origin of the fiddle in Africa, like like many scholars were telling me. Uh, the fiddle comes from Cremona, and and the first one and oldest is the one by Amati, and right. and you know, and 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 yes, uh, some. Some of us might not like it, or I don't have a problem with it personally, but it's the confluence of, of, of many different cultures. And that is what is beautiful about multiculturalism and diversity. Nothing right. more multicultural, nothing more diverse than the fiddle, than and the, the violin. Yeah. And, and all its shapes and forms, because of course, you know, it existed in Africa, just didn't look like a fiddle. Like, it didn't look yes, like, like, it existed, like a stringed like, instrument with a bow, yeah. Like, like existed in China. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. Like everywhere in the world, this, this getting a, a bow to strike between or on top of a string to make sounds. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it was definitely a, a way that, that the slaves could buy their freedom. Uh, in, in one example, um, I'm trying to remember who it was that bought his freedom. Um, oh, I think it was like, Southworth. Yes. Southwood, yeah. Yes. So who, has, who has a particular connection? I have to go visit his gravesite because here I am in Corvallis. Oh. You're there? Oh my God, I wanted and, to go. Do you know that there's so many Joe Thompson, Eston Hemmings Jefferson, you know, of course, Lewis Southworth, Frank Johnson. There's just so many people I have to I have to look up and 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 learn learn from so I'm ex but excited also that that one of those heroes is is right here you know? yeah and, and, and I'm sorry and there is some, another thing that is very interesting about him which is the the his his the the, the men who, who who brought him to Oregon and he said you can buy your freedom by working on the gold uh, you know digging gold panning for gold and he probably panned the first two weeks, and then he was in the camp. And he started playing the fiddle, and and the other men who were very uh, uh, melancholic about their 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 towns, you know, their their birthplace in Missouri and I don't know where, uh, started giving them giving him uh, bits of of gold, you know, yes, 
Reply and he one. said, he says, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's a better deal here, but you know, that at the same time that that's a, that that's something that that was afforded them that they could they had this this way of of, of earning their freedom. Why it almost makes me sad that that the, the escape slaves, for example, who played the fiddle, had to hide that fact perhaps because they'd be identified. I mean, there there there's 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 stories within stories, that, and and it just makes me go, how you know, yeah. you're you're, you're robbing people of of their of their way of life space right so it's complex it's very okay. complex extremely yeah i have a question for you earl about uh, a couple of questions about uh, the uh, fiddle shop talk you know in in um in the, the kind of music i play the cape breton style old scottish music Sometimes uh, you know you play with different tunings, also in Baroque music as well. I noticed uh, what was the tune um, Chucky in the that you played? Chucking, chucking the brush. Chucking, chucking the brush. Chucking the brush. Yeah. Chuck, chucking. Chucking the brush. No, no, not no, <laughs> not like I, Billy I, in the logo. <laughs> no, no, but like chucking the brush. Okay, chucking, chucking, chucking yeah, chucking the brush. And that, <laughs> you still think chucking. Thank you for correcting. <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. That's all right. Chucking. S h u c k. Okay. I n g. Okay. Yes. Chucking the brush. That so, you have, you you're playing in the a e a e tuning. So the bottom strings are the same pitches as the top strings, right? No, in that tune in that tuning, I'm playing uh, the top string is, is it's a. Uh, a D A E tuning. So okay. You, you tune your uh, G string up to an A. Okay. And what you'll find in uh, Southern Appalachian string band music, most tunes, uh, I'd say a very large percentage of tunes that are played in the key of D on the fiddle have that string tuned up. Okay. Uh, and it's funny, in the Scottish music, we have most of the I, a lot of the repertoire is, is on the pipes, on the on the Highland pipes. So it, it's right. all in the in the keys of mostly an A or a large uh -huh. part of it. So a lot of those tunes, those pipe tunes played on the fiddle, you tune the bottom strings both up. So you have A E right across. But in right. any case, you have this sense of kind of a bigger sound than you might otherwise. Everything's ringing, you know, with with more of the with the right, string sure. in the key. Sure. Another thing I noticed uh, fiddle wise is that uh, did I. I don't know if you were playing without a chin rest, but certainly some of the older photos and paintings of the fiddlers of the older generations were playing without a chin rest. And of course, it, it's a different way of, of playing. These days, of course, uh, any kind of modern fiddle player, uh, the, the fiddle is outfitted with a chin rest. You even put something under the fiddle, sometimes the shoulder rest, and you kind right. of lock it into place. But I noticed your style of playing, it's more relaxed, almost like like reminds me of, of more of a Baroque style of playing. So I was interested to hear, to see that. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, so when I was starting to play, and again, uh, initially I was mostly a dancer, but even as a dancer, you know, you go and you hang around, you look at a jam. Well, I was very much fixated on the fiddlers and especially the older guys and the older fiddlers, you know, they, the instrument was not dressed with a, a, a chin rest. And the older fiddlers, they did not have that uh, shoulder rest. Yeah. And uh, personally, I can't stand the shoulder rest. So <laughs> I have uh, <laughs> I have some fiddles where if I bought it and it had a chin rest, then it has a chin rest. If I bought it and it doesn't have a chin rest, then I, I, it doesn't have a chin rest. But uh, turning back there just a little bit about um, the variety of different tunings. I mean, I play tunings in uh, G, D, G, D, A, E, A, E. Um, D A uh, <laughs> D D A D. Is that the uh, low D? D the, the low G way down to D. All the way down to D. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's uh, tons of tunes in that tuning, but a lot of it too was uh, you know in the Appalachian Mountains you had a lot of people of Scottish and Irish descent who settled in those in the hills, and a lot of times I mean more of what a lot of the older guys told me was that like in West Virginia, for example, you have a lot of tunes coming out of that region that are tuned in that A E A E tuning. And um, a lot of it was because in terms of what I was told was that um, 
they tried to get the fiddle to mimic the bagpipe, whereby you have that constant drone, yeah. and then your dan notes will dance a around that constant drone. So when we're playing in the key of A, that's pretty much what we're trying to do. You're trying to keep that kind of like with the you're trying to keep that constant drone, and then you dance around that mm -hmm. drone with your notes. There you go. So many similarities. <laughs> oh yeah, very much so. In fact, uh, for a while I was uh, when I lived in upstate New York and uh, and went to Vermont a lot. I was pretty infatuated with the Quebecois and the, <laughs> the French Canadian fiddlers. But just like my Irish, when I play the French Canadian, it doesn't sound like <laughs> I, I get it's not old time. I noticed another thing in this film that you seem like an extremely patient teacher. I was moved very much by that moment in the film where you're counting and getting people to to strike the bow in the rhythm of your counting and everything. And I'm just going, wow, you know, like this is really back to basics. And mm -hmm. you just seem to be very comfortable and happy doing that and getting people introduced to what's the basic groove of right. playing that music. And that was really amazing. Do you do a lot of that? I do. I do. We uh, actually last year we started a camp here at our farm and the camp is different from what I mentioned a little while ago about the Fiddler's Jam. The Fiddler's Jam is a gathering, an annual gathering of friends of friends and family of friends. Uh, we don't charge anything for it. We shut that we own a bakery here on the farm. So we shut the bakery down and it's all about uh, food and play music. Uh, Nothing is scheduled, so people, most of the people come are musicians, but then I'd say, I'd, I'd say probably about 85 to 90% of the people that come are musicians. Last year, we had about 300 people that came. They camp out for three to four days and just play music and, and eat food. Uh, the music camp within itself was uh, sort of an idea or part of my initial uh, uh, overall goal when I moved here from California was um, <clears throat> instead of traveling so much to teach at other people's camps, I want to invite you know, my musician friends here and we would basically start our own camp. So um, this year we're working on building cabins, building a pavilion. Um, I have eight students that I teach in Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, when I first moved here, they have a program in Floyd. In fact, it's, 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 uh, it's spread over three states, uh, Tennessee, uh, North Carolina, and Virginia. And they call it the JAMS program. And JAMS is, um, means uh, Junior Appalachian Musicians. So it was an organization that was started basically to perpetuate <clears throat> this music uh, that is so rich in this area because I mean, just like, <clears throat> for example, when I went to visit Joe Thompson, um, you know, it was at a time when I was looking for black fiddlers. And when he first saw me, he thought that, you know, that he was the only black fiddler alive. <laughs> and, but I asked him, I said, well, you know, who are the people that you play with, hoping that he can introduce me to other people in his community? that he continued to play with. And he said, well, most of, of them had died and none of the young people had any interest in playing the music at all. And he said at that time he had a little grandchild who uh, every time he took out his fiddle, he would, it would show an interest. But other than that, hmm. you know, there wasn't a lot of continued interest. Yes, so, you are the doing jams, yeah, the Shoot Through the Jams program, are, are you finding that the, that the legacy is a little healthier? Um, healthier? Yes, I think so. I mean, when, you know, again, looking back, um, of the three states, I'm probably the only black person teaching mm -hmm. old-time fiddle in all of the uh, Tri-County Jams programs. Mm -hmm. Again, just as <laughs> Eduardo, might have had <laughs> trouble finding black fiddlers, but he found <laughs> blacks who played the fiddle. It's because, you know, there are, there are none, or there actually there have been scores, but 
little in terms of documentation. I think I, I recently sent, um, I call him Bradley. <laughs> I recently sent him a piece that a friend of mine sent to me from the Midwest yes. about a, a fiddler. Yeah. Yeah. There, is, there, there is something, I mean, uh, he's, uh, Errol is being awfully modest here because he's, it's not only uh, educating through teaching, but educating through the example. And the, 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 the fiddle from Northern New York that he mentioned before that went last year to the camp, his name is David Roberts. He's on our, on our movie as well. And, um, and he went to one of the camps and he was inspired by Earl. And, and, it's, and it's quite a joy to watch him play with Earl on the breaks and on the, um, because he, he, he inspires people who, who want to, to become, you know, to play that music and to play in, in the terms that have been laid down by Earl. And so it's not just the teaching is the example. Yeah, I I, find, I, think, I was drawn to the to Earl to your energy is that, you know, a welcoming, gentle, warm energy is just kind of, even just in the documentary uh, setting, I just kind of brought me, kind of close closer to the screen and wanting to 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 kind of enter your world. So I I'm hoping that that's that's the case for for many of the younger yeah. people in your community. I hope, yeah. People. I hope so too, and that's that's what I try to inspire, especially when I teach. Is uh, there's this um, little quote in the world of fiddling, and it's I'm going to take out my fiddle and rosin my bow and make myself welcome wherever I go. Uh, <laughs> and that's what I try to do. <laughs> it's extremely inspiring to to listen to you, and 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 maybe the jams can be a uh, another subject for another film who knows down the oh, road yeah. and speaking of which eduardo i wouldn't want to uh, leave this wonderful chat before i ask you about your your next project which is uh, which is i think developing at the moment yeah i mean i'm in new york right now in manhattan and uh my next project um, my last project was about a sculpture called um daniel chester french he did the lincoln memorial but then I realized that he didn't do the Lincoln Memorial. He conceived the Lincoln Memorial. The Lincoln Memorial was carved by Italian immigrants. So then I realized that the same thing happened with the Washington Memorial and the, and the Jefferson Memorial and, and Rush, the, the, the Rushmore. And so, uh, so it, it seems like the, the New England uh, uh, class of um, white Anglo Anglicans uh, uh, men designed the monuments, but they didn't know how to carve the marble, <laughs> so they had to call the Italians. So the film is called The Italian Factor, which is <laughs> how Italians came in to save the New Englanders uh, from embarrassment. And you are rewriting history in a fantastic way. This is, this is really exciting. Wow, so we look forward to that. And, and especially to everybody who's listening to this conversation to go and, and watch this Black Fiddlers film, um, which is really, truly, I've also watched it three times now. And every time I discover something new in it, and I get closer to the music and the players, and I feel like I can hear things in the music that I couldn't hear before. And it's really, it's really very, very broad. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it covers a lot of territory, a lot of people, a lot of different players. It's, it's huge what you've managed to do. And thank uh, anyway, thank you so, so much. Um, thank you all. Thank you, David Greenberg. Thank you, Earl. Thank you, Eduardo, yeah. for being here today. And uh, I hope that uh, not only this film will be watched with a lot of interest, but all your other films, Eduardo. So thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. And if any of you are ever happen to be in Virginia on the third weekend in July, always the third weekend in July, come by the Fiddler's Jam. Got it. What was that? What was that saying again? Got a fiddle. I'm going to take out my fiddle and rosin my bow 
and make myself welcome wherever I go. We'll see you Bravo. next time. All right. Thank you.